risk and risk in later life, which will take a different, very different perspective from myself. Um, Lizzie, do we have my screen up? Is yeah, just a sec, just a sec. Thank you very yeah, much. Now it's back, yeah. Thank you very much, it is. Okay, now let me warn you, I am being deliberately provocative with this presentation. And the reason why I'm doing this is that this seems to be a moment uh, in, in many spheres where we're starting to stepping back and looking at ourselves and uh, seeing if, you know, maybe we want to make some adjustments. So this is a particularly um, a provocative piece uh, in, in order for us to step back and look and see whether actually gerontology is being ageist and whether we could change that in some way. So, um, so um, are you going to be managing the slides, Lizzie? Uh, yes. Okay, that's great. Could I have the next one? Right. So, so the question is, um, is gerontology inadvertently reinforcing ageist thinking, especially in terms of our understanding of the experience of aging? And the problem that we have is this central tautology that old age explains old age. And this is a sort of dance that we have trying to get away from it, but coming back to it all the time. And the problem with the tautology is that it encourages us to take concepts and frameworks generated in one context and apply them elsewhere purely on the grounds that they are about age. And this is one of the reasons why we set up the SIG, which is to question that and whether those things need to be rather different for the uh, ageing in, in the um, global south or not. The, um, the other question, the thing that the tautology encourages us to do is to take at face value what older people say, as though they are authentic in their responses to us as researchers, and, and, and also maybe more widely, and whether older people are being boxed into feeling vulnerable, lonely, or destitute. So next slide, please. So um, I'm using Judith Butler's work on precarious life as a spur to thinking about gerontology's role in, in perpetuating ageism. Um, and she asked us to think about how particular lives become classed as less valuable. Um, and we've seen this certainly in Britain uh, with COVID, with the idea that, OK, sacrifices of older people uh, as against uh, the economy and younger people's rights. So she she asks us to think about how particular lives become classed as less valuable, such that the loss of those lives is, felt, is less felt um, and less likely to stir action. And she proposes the idea that lives become devalued. So as a spur to thinking, I was wondering whether gerontology's representations of age actually strip people of their individuality, their histories and their context. And whether this, and it seems to me that this could happen in a couple of places, one of which is the anonymized massing of populations marked only by age. But, and, and with that comes the assumption of frailty, dependence and vulnerability. And the other way it might do is this, is this thing of the knowledge production process that empowers the knowers, academics, practitioners, um, who produce necessarily simplified stylized representations of later uh, life and disempower the known in that process. Um, and that's to do obviously with defining policies to writing articles and so on. But in that process, um, uh, it may be, be actually uh, pushing ageist thinking. So we are in danger of reproducing representations that reinforce the sense of lives less valued. And the other thing about her work that made me that, you know, that I thought about was that the idea of becoming devalued, like going into old age, becoming devalued, is that maybe an oversimplification? It's only one side of the coin because some lives, are, well, all lives become valued, right? Um, and But some lives sustain value, some lose value, and some are never valued or never very much valued. And this is where the issues of class, gender, race, ethnicity, labor market, location, et cetera, come in and, and determine value with the capacity to sustain value. So, uh, so the question here is, you know, taking from Butler, 
is gerontolo gerontological research bolstering a sense of precariousness? So the sense of living precarious lives is an emotionally loaded evaluation of lived experience. Older people present those feelings or affects and we collect those representations or we collect data like census data on living arrangements or whatever um, and we attribute uh, affects to them. We attribute the idea that, you know, living alone is, is a vulnerable, uh, unhappy sort of situation. But affects are structured and constructed, and they're, they're constructed and constructed through inter interaction, through hailing by, you know, assuming or talking to people as though they have, uh, that they're vulnerable or frail or whatever, and also by context. So the, the result is that a person's view of their experience is not fixed or objective. You can't collect one view, this person feels vulnerable. But the, the experience, um, uh, the feelings are fluctuating and interpretive and inconsistent. They are contextualized and performative. So, um, so you can go one day to somebody and they'll say, oh, my son, you know, doesn't look after me. And then, you know, I'm very vulnerable and I've been abandoned. And the next day they'll say, oh, well, he has problems, you know, and he's got, you know, I understand, et cetera. And things are like they are. So very different sort of feelings. But if we're collecting only on one day, we get very different experiences. So um, uh, what we gather is contextualized and performative. And if we don't recognize and address this, we're likely to be bolstering ageism, classism, and sexism, uh, because people may well provide the, the standard response to you on the first encounter. So, um, so for example, much research assume, assumes female widows are particularly vulnerable, that older men can get, can do, are doing fine, or that they're better placed, so they're less of a problem in the hierarchy. The younger generations, in most, most cases this is thought of as in terms of sons being male, that the one, that younger generations exist, and two, that gener younger generations are capable of supporting natal and marital families. And when this becomes embedded in research practices, um, these assumptions, um, these three assumptions, are likely to re reinforce hierarchies and uh, gender hierarchies and intergenerational dependencies. So, um, so you get these broad narratives where women are dependent on male incomes and family support. They are less skilled workers. They have been taken in by they're taken in by family, whereas widows, their respect is diminished, or they must live devalued lives of destitution from which they need saving. So you have a victim narrative. Whereas men, by definition, are thought of as financially independent, they can cope in the labor market, are better paid, have desired, desired skills, and they can support dependents and are respected and are looked after by family in old age, so not victims. So the research is continually engaging with these narratives, either by reproducing them or by providing divergent examples. And, which, and the divergent examples provide complexity to the image that we have, but they don't really challenge the narrative. They don't, they're not enough to challenge the narrative. And one of the key obstacles to challenging the narrative is what, is what receives credence as evidence. And currently this keeps driving us back to research uh, that uh, confirms ageist assumptions. Uh, the, there are some emerging developments, especially around uh, census data on older people's work participation and time use studies. But frequently the, 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 the places where we're called to provide our evidence, whether it's in publications or in policy making, um, you know, they want numbers and numbers are anonymizing and numbers don't deal with that complexity. So we tend to fall back or get driven into sort of things that might uh, might actually be uh, bolstering aging, ageist thinking. So uh, Lizzie, next, please. OK, so here's where I bring in some of the, the research that I've been doing. I've been researching in India since 1989. So the picture on the left is uh, an older woman who uh, she's a, a, a vegetable vendor um, uh, on pavements, uh, you know, just sets up on pavement. She's just come from the market. The woman on the right is an agricultural worker 
um, who um, who's just coming back from working in the field. And uh, let's see if I can. Oh no, I can't move this. Okay, so um, so uh, the in confounding the gender and age narrative, we need to look at local job markets, and those markets are important both for older and younger people, and they make a difference. Now, it seems to me, having worked in cities and in rural areas, that cities provide more economic space than rural areas do. Um, but in both cases, but especially in rural areas, I found that women start out in their 30s, approximately, helping husbands to provide for the family because they, they're not able to do so, but then end up supporting uh, husbands. And they're supporting husbands uh, because uh, of age discrimination and uh, old, their older husband, they're all, always five, ten years older, have um, uh, are no longer working or not working very much. I've also seen that rather than widows being automatically struggling, that they are able to form households with their widowed or deserted daughters. And while those relationships stay, like the husband doesn't come back, the deserted, deserting husband doesn't come back, they're, they're, you know, they're quite solid uh, households. So, um, um, uh, and, um, and I've also found that uh, women's evaluation of their life uh, can fluctuate widely particularly in areas of low work and low government support uh, because of uh, the struggle that the whole family network, whether they're living in the same household or not, de has to deal with. OK, so three minutes, Penny. OK, I think I might be there. Thank you. Um, so uh, if you look at rural men in particular, you and you interview them, you'll get this veneer of accepting old age. Oh, we're too old. We're retired now, etc. But uh, there is, if below that, there is a sense of a life uh, deemed less valuable by employers, um, uh, and that's just below the surface. And you get a really strong sense. You can get a really strong sense of discrimination and insult and anger about that. Um, and while, and what was interesting is that while women will go and beg for work from uh, employers of farmers and so on, men won't do that. That's just too much of a step for them. They will not beg for work and they would rather not work. And of course, actually, most of them have wives who will work. So that, that sort of gets them out of that situation. So, um, so with and at this point, I might just add who these two people are. So the older guy was working for a, a very large farmer, a big landlord. And just at the point when he should be retiring, she stopped uh, giving him work. And he had an expectation that she would look after him in old age. And he's had to go out and find more work. Now, the man on the right has no sons. And he has to live with his daughter, which is exactly where he shouldn't be. And he feels because he's basically he sees himself as living on his uh, son-in-laws. So that makes him a, a beggar in that context. Um, and, um, you know, brought in for real for a man to be in this situation, it's considered to be very humiliating. And he will not ask for anything, will not ask for medical help, anything from them. They just feed him. So without the correct support from the sons or wives or employers, older men add humiliation to vulnerability and deprivation. Being fed by daughters, taking on women's work, that's another thing that will happen, uh, that they'll take on women's work and they'll stress, oh, I'm doing it to support my wife because she can't get through her women's work in the field and I'm helping her. But actually, they're getting an income. Um, so there's this very strong sense for these older men of a life less valuable. So, One more minute, Penny. OK, let's see if we can skip to what we've got next here. OK, I just wanted to say that there is um, that with uh, COVID, a lot of livelihoods have been lost. These people are all working in a wholesale market and that wholesale market has been closed. And it may create dependencies that appear to confirm ageist assumptions. And we need to resist this by demonstrating the details of how individuals have shifted from independence to dependence and destitution. So I think the conclusion is now. Is he? Fantastic. So the question is, does ontological precarity, the sense of living a precarious life, help us to understand ageism? And it has spurred some thoughts. And for me, what I found most interesting is that in practice, lives are differently valued. And these social and social economic uh, Social and economic differences feed into these values. 
uh, the social value and life chances that allow some to rise above and remain untouched by ageism. And I thought, actually, I hadn't really quite realized that. Some people are never really touched by ageism, while others accumulate disadvantage that subject them particularly to ageism. So we need to interrogate our research practices to mitigate their contribution to ageist thinkings, thinking massifications, population level analysis is inherently objectifying and requires really careful handling. And we need a more sophisticated understanding of the structuring of effect and the contextualized performativity of the research encounter. And we need to resist decontextualized, dehistoritized accounts that perpetuate ageist narratives by suggesting or giving the impression that age is age is age is age uh, throughout time and place. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Penny, and well done for keeping to um, this very strict timetable. Um, I think now we're going to have um, five minutes for questions and answers before we go on to our, our, our next presentation from, from Elizabeth. And I'm just looking on the chat function to see, at the moment, I don't see any very specific questions coming through. Um, so please do, um, you know, write any questions in the chat function um, so that then I can convey them on your behalf to the speaker. Um, I, I think that's the way we're doing it, isn't it, um, yep. guys? Yeah, OK. I mean, I've got a couple of very quick questions. I mean, one is this issue about, you know, labelling and categorising people. Um, it, you know, there's always the tension between needing to simplify reality and complexify it and contextualise reality. So, for example, if you're looking at people's entitlements to, let's say, a pension, you may say, well, people over a given age are entitled to this pension or people under a given age are required to go to school, which is something I'm going to be grappling with in September again. Um, you know, and, and, and clearly to make the world work, both in terms of making sense of it as academics and in terms of people's rights and entitlements and policy, you know, you, you, you know everybody has uniquely messy lives. You, you have to simplify. So how can we strike this balance between saying that you have a certain status which is simplistic and can't take into account deep intersectionality as much as we would like, uh, but it still enables us to avoid, um, uh, you know, bias and prejudice and discrimination and stereotyping. Um, well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to have the answers, um, but I think the thing is, is to actually, uh, the, I think from the whole process for, of, of conducting research, from starting out with your questions, right through to your analysis. You have to be very careful about whether you're feeding into um, ageist thinking. Um, and it, it's really, really problematic because you, um, you know, we tread the line always very carefully um, uh, between, you know, suggesting something, wanting something to happen, policies and so on to happen. And, and uh, these things can be flipped against you know, our, our intention. So it's really, really difficult, but I think it's really important to go back and think about it, to think from the start. And it's it's very important just from, you know, from the, the whole process, from the beginning of getting grants and to get publications and to be, to be um, uh, for policies and so on to be take place, because you have to fit into what people are already think. And the problem is, that instead of necessarily changing that thinking, we may be, in order to get a result sooner rather than later, we may be confirming or using or uh, sort of ageist thinking. And that's, you know, this is the, the point of this, is to try and think about how we can pull back on that somehow. Thank you. I've got a really good question here from Gloria, who says, do you think one of the problems, <laughs> oh, that's an unfortunate word actually, is that um, gerontology and research often, their starting point is that old age in itself is a, a problematic condition? Yes, I think that's exactly the point that, that you know, uh, the endless amount of stuff that we've been, that we hear about loneliness and vulnerability and frailty, and so on. And the idea that, you know, that policies are about getting people from like active aging and so on, getting people from this assumed 
difficult position and try and you know get them to be aging so it's like we've got older people now we're going to try and improve the situation so we do start with that as opposed to starting with you know the opposite might be which is what causes people to lose their to lose their value what causes people to uh, become um um you know disadvantaged in some way so instead of trying to rectify it we should be stopping it happening in the first place and seeing that in a different way so yes i agree great well thank you so much Penny. uh we need to move on there may be some related discussion which cross cuts all the talks at the very end of the session uh but thank you so much and thank you for keeping to time and now i'm going to hand over to elizabeth schroeder butterfield um, from the University of Southampton, who's going to talk about long-term care for older people in Indonesia. And, um, well, it's got a question mark at the end of it, um, unsustainable and unjust question mark. And, and maybe we will have an answer to that question to some extent uh, 15 minutes from now. Thank you. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, excellent. clearly. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm really delighted that our symposium has such a, a large and international audience. So thank you very much uh, for attending. My talk addresses the question of how older people's care needs can be met in sustainable, fair and culturally acceptable ways. I lead a research project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which aims to answer this question for Indonesia the world's fourth largest population. The fieldwork for this project has just been delayed due to the coronavirus, and I'm therefore going to start with a brief case study from a different project I'm involved in, which is funded by the Australian Research Council. And this project looks at vulnerability across the life course. So here's a case study. Sriyama was a woman in her early 60s living on Java. She suffered from diabetes and had a stroke from which she initially made a good recovery. However, a fall, possibly due to a second stroke, left her with a badly broken leg. She was advised to have an operation, but was fearful of medical practitioners, and her husband worried about the potential costs, despite having joined the new Indonesian health insurance system. Thus, Sriyama was taken to an alternative healthcare provider several times for nerve massages. These failed to improve her condition, and subsequently, she accessed no further healthcare. Sriyama lived with her husband and a married daughter who works in a nearby factory. Most of her care was provided by Sriyama's husband, who had to give up his work as a construction worker to look after her. He was outwardly frustrated by this and by the fact that his wife was making no progress. A nearby daughter, not in paid work, sometimes helped, but she has four children. Without help, Sriyama's husband found it difficult to move Sriyama from bed to chair or chair to wheelchair, and so she often spent hours in the same position. One of Sriyama's two sons provided some monetary support, and a neighbor sometimes visited. After 18 months of being care dependent, Sriyama died. Her husband has not resumed paid work. Now, in many ways, Sriyama's case is not unusual. We found that many Indonesians experience the onset of care needs quite early due to common risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke. We repeatedly encountered a pattern of healthcare use in the early stages of an older person's health crisis, followed by disengagement from medical care. Recourse to alternative medicine is also not rare, but covered entirely by out-of-pocket payments. Commonly reported barriers to healthcare use include access, particularly around transport, lack of home visits, fear of doctors, dissatisfaction with the new health insurance system, and related to this, concerns about affordability. Family care is invariably the outcome of negotiation amongst multiple potential family carers. Typically, this involves a narrowing over time to one or two main actors. 
This narrowing often results in a reduction in the quality of care. Sriyama's ca case is slightly unusual in that the main carer is a man. Like everywhere, women are more commonly the main carers in Indonesia. However, I would say that in, in Indonesia, the involvement of husbands and also of sons is by no means rare. It depends very much on who else is in the network. It depends on culture, how acceptable, for example, cross-gender care is, and on negotiating power. So in Sriyama's case, the husband obviously lost out to his co-resident daughter in the negotiation of who should uh, take care of Sriyama. Sriyama's loss of status and respect, as witnessed by her husband's complaints about her quite openly to, uh, to us, is also not unusual. In previous research, we found that dependence was undermining of a person's social identity and well-being, at least in some parts of Indonesia. And finally, it's well known that caring Im impacts on the labor force participation, social participation and well-being of carers. <clears throat> and Sriyama's husband's situation, I think, attests to this very well. So this single case study recorded during ethnographic fieldwork in East Java in 2019 offers a lens on some of the challenges which long term care provision in Indonesia and other developing countries faces. The challenges are sorry, the challenges are around sustainability. So care, I would say, is not sustainable if it forces family members to choose between paid work and care or if it results in declining health and well-being of carers. We encountered another case where a woman didn't pursue chemotherapy for her breast cancer because she felt unable to leave her bedridden husband for whole days at a time. Then there's challenges around equitability. Care is not equitable if it disproportionately falls on families rather than entailing a more collective response um, to what is a very common risk in aging societies. It's also not fair if within families it disproportionately falls on women or those with the weakest bargaining position. And finally, there are challenges around quality. So I think quality is not as good, care quality is not as good as it could be if it does not include access to health care or if it does not accommodate people's cultural and personal preferences or facilitate a valued existence for the cared for person. Now, Indonesia is at a critical juncture because it's confronting the reality of rapid demographic aging in a context of equally dramatic social and economic changes. Currently, there are 26 million Indonesians over the age of 60 this is set to increase to 43 million in the next 10 years. 13% of in older Indonesians are classed as being poor and many more are near poor. Only 10% receive a pension, while a quarter live in households that receive some form of so, um, social assistance program, but uh, these programs tend to be very much below uh, what, what people actually need. Indonesia is incredibly diverse ethnically and culturally. It also has massive disparities in terms of health infrastructure. So into this complicated context, Indonesia is trying to develop a long term care strategy. And this is made particularly difficult by the fact that there are aging issues come under different ministries and Indonesia is incredibly decentralized. A central pillar of Indonesia's um, nascent um, long-term care strategy is the well-developed network of primary health centers. Yet depending on where you live, the nearest health center may be more than an hour away. Communities are therefore expected to operate local level health posts for older people called Posyandu Lansia with the help of a community nurse and an army of volunteers. At their best, these offer fortnightly health checkups, non-prescription medication, advice on healthy lifestyles, communal exercise and team building among older people. Many of the volunteers are elderly themselves. Most are women, which puts off some men from attending. 
Because they operate at the grassroots level, they hold excellent local knowledge about who the vulnerable, frail or care dependent older people are. And this has been a key strength during the current Corona pandemic. So despite health posts halting their regular activities and health centers very much discouraging older people from attending, the volunteers have often continued monitoring their older clients via WhatsApp or visits up to the doorstep. A main disadvantage of the government mandated elderly health posts is that their curative remit is extremely limited. Any serious health needs have to be referred up to primary health centres and from there upwards on to hospitals and specialists. The case of Sriyama earlier noted some of the issues with these providers, such as access, waiting times, bureaucracy, cost, problems with the new health insurance system, etc. Another drawback is that in most communities they do not offer home visits. This means that care dependent people typically cease using them at the point at which they and their carers would most value external advice and encouragement. This is where charities, NGOs or private long term care uh, providers come in. They often offer a mix of services, variously including home visits, day centers, physical care for those without family members, chairs, or material support. They're incredibly proactive, resourceful, tailored to local needs, but their coverage is minute compared to national demand, and they sometimes risk being partisan by catering to particular religious groups or social classes. Policy planners in Indonesia are trying to identify best practice examples from this huge variety of community care um, initiatives and to, assess, and to assess what might be scaled up or applied elsewhere. The difficulty, I would argue, is that they're trying to do this in the absence of detailed information of what older people's care needs are, how common these care needs are, and how they change over time. For instance, estimates of dementia prevalence range from 6% to 35%. Similarly, not enough is known about what family carers need to help them in their care provision. So if we think back to Sriyama, some home visits by a physiotherapist might have been welcome or an allowance to bring in some paid care to permit the husband to continue working. If a key aim of formal care initiatives is to make care more equitable, we need to know how care is negotiated within family networks what tangible and intangible assets matter in the bargaining of care and how care dependent older people are valued. Three minutes, Elizabeth. Last, lastly, we need to understand which older people are most vulnerable to not having their care needs met because they lack family, because they're incredibly poor, because of their poor reputation, which can exclude them from these very community based um, initiatives or based on where they live. <clears throat> so my team of Indonesian and British researchers and I hope to answer some of these questions and contribute to an empirical base for policy planning. As part of a comparative project on care networks in Indonesia, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, we will conduct in-depth ethnographic research in six communities across Indonesia. This will then be followed by randomized household surveys in the same locations. The different locations spread across um, Indonesia capture important cultural variation as well as different health and social care infrastructures. Some are urban, others rural, one is quite remote. Some of the sites have been studied before as part of research funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Australian Research Council and that means that we know some of these communities and the people in them already really quite well. The ideas are central to the research and its methodology, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm ending in, um, on, don't worry, Peter. So first, we consider care a cultural practice. We think that culture shapes preferences for care providers, what counts as acceptable care, and what being dependent does to a person's identity. 
This is why we will use ethnography and compare different ethnic groups across Indonesia. Second, care in its wider sense is often provided by a mix of close and distant family members, neighbors, healthcare providers, volunteers, religious organizations, and so on. And this is why we think we need to take a sort of networked approach and collect data on complete care networks and how they evolve over time. And third, we understand that older people are very diverse and that this shapes their experiences of care. And this is why we collect information on economic, demographic and social status and compare care among economic strata and other um, subgroups. As I mentioned earlier, the start of field work has unfortunately been delayed due to the COVID crisis. But when finally we can start, we hope that the research will be even more policy relevant than before. Thank you for your attention. Thank you Thank very you much. Very I was looking sorry there for the slight delay in responding. Yeah, <laughs> fine. Um, that, that's, that, that's really great. great. Again, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for questions in the chat yeah. function and uh, none have come through so far. I did notice with Penny's talk that a load of questions came in um, a few minutes after we'd, we'd finished her session. So there may be a delay with the chat function. I'm not entirely sure about that. But again, I will, I will leap into the breach and, and ask a question myself while we're waiting for more to come through. Um, and that is, to what extent are you going to consider um, long-term care and social care for older people also as a new industry, as a new sector? Because certainly in many emerging economies, you're seeing you know, that there's a large um, and growing participation of private for profit providers, both in terms of um, nursing agencies, uh, where the definition of nurse can be extremely loose, um, residential facilities and other kinds of provision. Uh, and, and given that, you know, the, the capacity of the Indonesian state to regulate the private sector is, 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 is not widely viewed as very good, do you see this as a kind of potential wild west that can, is, could already be starting to emerge in some of the larger urban centres? And how does this fit within your wider interests? which are already incredibly diverse. You're looking at so many things, but um, mm. this is a particular hobby horse of mine, as you know, and I just wondered how you're going to try and fit yeah. that into the jigsaw yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think any any information that we kind of um, collect about that will be sort of more on the margin. So we want to conduct some, some kind of stakeholder um, um, interviews and wherever an older person in the communities that we we study um, uses or engages some form of paid or private care, then then we will kind of pursue that and try and uh, and try and gather information on it. But I was quite keen that we don't kind of do uh, research in a sort of incredibly middle class, uh, wealthy uh, part of, of of Indonesia or corner of Jakarta, say, uh, because I think um, I, I really want to understand how these uh, issues play out for people uh, who, who don't have the means to, to, to bring in sort of uh, very, very expensive um, care provision. But sort of small scale paid care um, is, is, is definitely um, uh, even even occurring already in, in, in villages. Um, and so so that will be an interesting um, thing to see. So when we when we just looked at this a, f a few years ago, uh, some communities were so kind of proud that they, they wouldn't really admit to paid care, but it was certainly uh, happening, um, but it was then sort of dressed up as, as family care. Um. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions have come through. One is from, from Penny um, asking about, um, you know, that you're going to be doing a household survey, but uh, to what extent do older people live between different households, which is something that you see in other parts of the world, and how would that then affect your, your own survey? And then I'll take two or three together because they're coming through now. A question from Caitlin saying that um, she's particularly interested in um, this idea of having the status of primary caregiver and the way in which care is negotiated. It doesn't seem to be so much a question, but just a comment saying this looks like it's going to be a really interesting aspect of your research as it goes forward. Um, and then, uh, yes, just a follow up to um, Penny's um, question and observation that you see quite a lot of this sort of um, older people um, living across different households in, in Nepal, for example, which is an observation made by, by Sarah. So um, would you like to respond to those, please? 
Yes, thank you. So, uh, yeah, Penny, I mean, we, we, we find these sort of fluid household arrangements certainly in, in Indonesia as well. Um, and the, the extent to which we can pick them up in the household survey, um, I, I don't know. I think if, if, if they appear as, as, as significant in the ethnography, then we will make sure that we can capture that. Um, we certainly kind of, um, in, 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 in previous surveys we've done, we've asked questions about kind of to what extent do sort of people share meals or is there anybody who doesn't live in this household but who, who often eats here. So, so I think um, it, we, we will basically be guided by the ethnography and if in a particular community this is uh, significant, uh, then, then we will try and, 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 and design the survey so that it can capture that. So, for example, um, in, in the previous survey, we had um, uh, some, some, some communities had more com compound um, households where um, it looked like one house, but actually there were sort of s several households within it. And, and, and we managed to kind of uh, collect data on that. Uh, and then in other communities that didn't seem to be so uh, significant. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, uh, for, for your comment. I mean, I think this issue about negotiation is really important because uh, it, it seems to be that um, it, it, it often starts, uh, care provision often starts as a very collaborative um, um, affair, uh, but then if it carries on for longer, people drop drop out of the picture. And um, I think that's where kind of an, a better understanding of, of people's bargaining position, but also in, in how older people are evaluated and, and, and valued, how the, the life of older people is valued uh, will matter. And I think that connects a bit to, to Penny's uh, talk, that kind of we really need to understand um, the different ways in which um, older people's lives are valued uh, in their families and in their communities, because I think that has a has a key bearing on um, how they are cared for, whether they still have access to, to health care or uh, or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I look forward to looking at that. Thank you. Um, well, um, thank you again for keeping to time. We are doing so well in terms of time. Of course, I'm just obsessed about timekeeping. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and so, um, yes, I'm now happy to move to our, our, our third um, talk, which is uh, given by Saliu Balogan, who is in Australian National University and Aravinda Guntupali, who's based at the University of Aberdeen, and they're going to be talking about gender and socioeconomic difference in incident mobility disability among older adults in Nigeria. So over to you, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. I'm not so sure if you can see the slides. They're still loading, I think. Yeah, I, I, I can start talking yeah, about... we can see them. We can see them. Oh, they're not in slideshow mode, but we can see them. Ah, okay, okay. So I'll move to slideshow mode. Hopefully. Oh, it's not letting me to go on the slideshow mode. Why don't you just? Oh, why don't you just do uh, regular? I'll just do the regular one. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, welcome to the presentation. I'll be talking about gender and social demographic difference in incident mobility disability among older people in Nigeria. Um, this paper is written uh, initially. Salu and I were talking about uh, inequalities in uh, later life in Nigeria, and he started his master thesis project looking at prevalence of incident mobility disability in Nigeria. And we published it in 2016, and we were very keen to understand the complexities and also the longitudinal nature of it. And then we uh, met again last year and decided to look at the complexity of this incident mobility disability and gender inequalities. Because it's really unholy hour in Australia, he's not able to join us, so I'll do the full presentation. Um, I really like the way Penny started uh, making my quantitative presentation kind of interesting because she challenged some of the aspects of quantitative methods. And I do agree with her to a certain extent, but not fully. I'll say why. Very often, poverty and inequalities are invisible for many people. For example, the context I come from in India, we see poor people, vulnerable people everywhere. We get used to them. We don't, we cannot challenge it because of invisibility that exists. So I personally feel that providing some kind of numbers to policymakers, to government officials 
is a complex way of saying, look, this is the level of invisibility. This is the level of vulnerability. We need to strengthen our policy debates. So as an anthropologist uh, as well, I believe that we need to have mixed methods. So just using numbers doesn't really help. So that is what we are going to present um, today. So we'll show the evidence that exists and we'll talk a little bit more about what we found with the mobility disability in Nigeria. As we all know, mobility is vital to healthy aging and has been linked with quality of life of older people. A cross-national study looking um, at data from 70 countries, which also included Africa and Southeast Asian countries, showed that regions with more bias against women are likely to report higher gender inequality in mobility disability. So I think this is really, really important to understand that mobility disability might not just be mobility disability, it is very complex. It's not as simple as mobility disability because we see a strong association. Another global study from 57 countries, again, using similar kind of uh, World Health Service compilation from different income settings, including LMICs, showed that the prevalence of disability among women aged 50 plus was substantially higher. It was 40.1% compared to men aged 50 plus. What they have done is they went further one step ahead and tried to decompose the analysis on understanding why do we see this high gender inequalities. And they uh, showed that 45% of this gender inequality in disability could be straight away attributed to social demographic differences between men and women. So in fact, many of us are used to this kind of debate that women live longer, so they might have higher levels of mobility disability in later life. What these studies show is that already early on from 50 plus, we see higher gender inequalities, and then most of those are driven by the social demographic differences. So by understanding this from a policy perspective, we are able to kind of uh, strengthen the policies that could reduce the social demographic inequalities that could further reduce the gender gap in mobility disability. Majority of the studies we know are cross-sectional. However, there are some longitudinal studies as well. For example, uh, there is a study in the US looking at four different regions and they reported higher incidence mobility in women in their follow-up study. And they also showed that some of the functional decline were related to gender roles as well. Another international study showed that the undifferentiated gender roles and poor self-rated health at the baseline were associated with mobility disability in the longitudinal element of it. So what do we already know about gender and mobility disability in Nigeria? We and others have documented that gender inequality in mobility disability exists among Nigerian older adults. In our previous study, we showed a higher prevalence of mobility disability among women compared to men. It was 20% among women compared to 12.5% among men. Even after adjusting for socioeconomic and demographic characteristics, that gender inequality still remained significant. And the marginal effects of socio demographic health factors were stronger for women than for men. But what we don't know. So most of the studies look at prevalence, that is existing cases, whereas incidents look at new cases. So when we just look at prevalence, we do not know exactly when the disability started and we can't exactly kind of look at person years of exposure. Whereas when we have the incident study, what we can exactly look is they have exactly a time frame of exposure and we know that based on that, we can compare how socioeconomic inequalities can, compare, can contribute to these gender inequalities. It is not known whether there are gender differences in incident mobility disability among Nigerian older adults. And we believe that it is really important to understand not only the prevalence, but the incidence of it in the design of long-term and sustainable strategies to minimize inequality in mobility disability. To our knowledge, no previous study attempted it. So we are trying to fill the gap uh, using longitudinal data. So our study aims to address the following questions. Among individuals with no mobility disability at baseline, are there gender differences in the onset of mobility disability with two year exposure period among older people in Nigeria? And what other socio demographic factors are associated with incident mobility disability among Nigerian older adults? 
So we analyzed data from Nigeria General Household Survey Panel, which included 3,486 respondents, which was a national survey, and they included the people aged 50 and above at baseline. The Nigeria General uh, Household Panel Survey is a collaborative survey by the Nigeria National Bureau of Statistics in partnership with Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and the National Food Reserve Agency and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with the World Bank. As you can see, it's a massive partnership. They're not aiming to study um, inequalities in later life. We have selected the subgroup of 50 and above, but their main focus is to understand agricultural patterns and employment related issues and also understanding rural inequalities as well. So using that uh, study, we uh, are looking into mobility disability. So we have taken the first wave 2010-11 of Nigeria General Household Survey panel and merged it with the second wave. So we can then look at what happened in the last two years uh, by using the self-reported difficulty in walking one kilometer. I'll come to the different measures as well in my later slide. Um, what we have done is we have excluded who already had mobility disability in the first wave and only kept those that did not have mobility uh, disability that have no or yes mobility disability in the later part. So we excluded the first uh, phase that we used and that resulted in 2,715 people. So out of those, 8.3% uh, reported incident mobility disability. So these are the new cases of uh, mobility disability challenges in the past two years of the study. And uh, what happened was using those, we were able to see if there is an association uh, between the gender and socioeconomic factors in shaping inequalities in those. Uh, there were different measures of mobility disability, walking 100 meters, walking one kilometer, walking uphill, running or lifting heavy object, bending or stooping or climbing stairs. So all these questions were asked to everyone in terms of if they had any difficulties in these aspects. And so this is not really a rich kind of uh, analysis, but it does give an understanding of what people perceive in terms of the difficulties in these measures. And then we use regression analysis to estimate uh, the extent to which socio-demographic conditions contribute to gender differences. So to quickly go to the analysis, you can see here that um, there is a strong gender gap in all the measures uh, that were collected, except for walking 100 meters, starting from the age of 50. So uh, females have reported, 10.1% of females reported difficulty in walking one kilometer compared to 6.9% uh, males. Walking uphill again, 14% of females reported some form of disability compared to males. And then running or lifting heavy object had, again, very high inequalities where 23% of females reported uh, difficulty compared to 14% males. So we can see that uh, we have very strong gender inequalities for most of those except for walking 100 meters. Uh, taking um, different kind of literature into consideration, we restricted our final model to walking uh, one kilometer as uh, an indicator of mobility disability for statistical analysis. So in addition, we also included, in addition to age and gender, we also included uh, other socioeconomic and demographic variables. Uh, we assess standard of living and socioeconomic status using expenditure data. So the household expenditure data takes into consideration total expenses paid for food and non-food expenditure as well, because the income data had a lot of missing values and income data is also very unreliable because it depends on the time, time of the year, it depends on various other things of people having multiple jobs at different points of time in the same year as well, we decided not to use that and look at expenditure data. So you, we uh, took the expenditure data and divided them into quintiles. And then we looked at the self-reported ill health that was assessed in response to a question asking whether a respondent suffered from any injury or illness in the past four weeks. We also have education and marital status variables where uh, we have created the dichotomous variables for attending school or never attending school and marital status currently married and not married. Because our sample size is very small for divorced and uh, not married, we combined the divorced, not married and widowed together as currently not married. Um, what changed in the last two years? The incident mobility disability showed the gender inequalities. We uh, see that 10.1% of females compared to 6.9% males had incident mobility disability. 
compared to our baseline study, it's smaller, but, but in the baseline study, it's a prevalent study. So it could have happened any point uh, before the study uh, data collection point. So we had 20 to 12 persons in our previous study. The incident Three rate. Three minutes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. The incident rate for women is higher than men after adjusting for socioeconomic status. So what we have seen, I can go to the table quickly and show you the results that what we see is uh, the gender inequality stand. We see strong age inequalities in the expected direction where the self-reported mobility disability increased, especially for 70 and above. And the marital status in the adjusted model did not show any significance, but self-reported illness at the first wave seemed to have an impact on the mobility disability incidents. The socioeconomic status did not show uh, significance except for the fourth uh, group, which doesn't really make sense. Again, this goes back to some of the challenges in using quantitative data and the weakness in them that we cannot understand the context and complexity in the issue. So um, what we say is that social demographic and health variables considered in the second wave explained between 6.5 to 6.8 percent of variance compared to our uh, initial study where the social economic variables explain much more of variance in mobility disability. Again, this suggests that the measurement needs further investigation and uh, we need to understand a little bit more about why uh, these uh, differences are happening. Um, I'll quickly say the respond, the challenges with the self-reported measure. Several studies, including the International Mobility and Aging Study, showed that uh, women have generally higher incidence of disability in self-reported measures compared to performance-based measures. So we are not actually measuring mobility disability because the self-reported uh, perception seem to be very different. When it comes to performance, the difference between males and females seem to be lower. That itself poses a very interesting question on measurement issues. And the other question is, what are the pathways? Another longitudinal study showed that early fertility, gendered roles, or domestic violence could have contributed to the self-perceived mobility disability as well. So mobility disability is such a complex thing that we are uh, kind of concluding in a way that, yes, we can explain some of the socioeconomic inequalities resulting in gender inequalities, but our data doesn't sufficiently capture either the variable itself on mobility disability, and secondly, also the way we don't have the information on some of those important aspects despite using longitudinal study, without which we cannot make strong policy recommendations. So to conclude, one uh, more minute. Yeah, conclusion Thank slide. <laughs> so we show that longitudinal, using longitudinal data, that gender gap in mobility disability uh, incidence is also significant in Nigeria. Our results suggest that bias against women could be associated with higher mobility disability, but self-reported mobility disability as a measure could reflect more than mobility disability, and we need to be really cautious in understanding those gender differences to improve policy focus. And again, going back to the point I started with, to improve our policies, we need stronger data sets, both qualitative and quantitative, to help us strengthen the evidence and the lack of stronger data on older people in LMICs continues to be a challenge. Yes, we do have a longitudinal data, but it's really complex to understand the simplification of some of the variables doesn't really help us understand what are the driving forces for those gender inequalities and just to highlight that uh, in the recent the demographic health survey, Nigeria seemed to have increased interpersonal violence, substantial increase, uh, almost by 10 to 15 percent points. So there needs to be further investigation on some of the challenges driving those inequalities. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. We've got lots of questions coming in, which is great. Um, Firstly, we have a question from Grace Lewis. Have you considered physical frailty in your um, investigation of mobility disability? Women have higher levels of physical frailty, which includes reduced physical activity and slower walking compared mm -hmm. to men across old age. However, women outlive men. A paradox, um, excuse me, a paradox that we haven't completely understood. Might it be useful, be a useful construct to look at? Yes. So that's quite a long question. And then we've got two or three other questions as well. So if you can respond to that one, and then I will pass on the other questions to you. Okay. 
Unfortunately, we do not have physical frailty. We were very keen to look at physical frailty. This is again going back to the data issues that we do not have such a complex information. But what we have seen in Bangladesh using a similar study, we looked at um, uh, micro data, census data, and very interesting comparisons came. The disability seemed to be higher for women where it's gadget related. So eye related or walking kind of, if somebody needs a stick or a glass, so those gadgets, to kind of cope with the disabilities or challenges were available to men more than women. So that kind of also drives a little bit of mobility, disability, and frailty studies as well. So I agree with you, Grace, we need to understand more of the paradox. And this is what we want. We want more data set. And unfortunately, we do not have frailty. And then a, a, a briefer question is, could you please say more about what is meant by bias against women in this yeah. specific context? Yeah, it is really complex because bias against women uh, here in Nigerian context is very complex. For some of you who might have seen some of the life expectancy data up until 1998 or 2001, there was already gender inequalities in life expectancy where women were not living longer compared to men. So there were very few countries in the world, like India and Nigeria, that had the paradox where life expectancy enjoyment did not happen for women compared to other countries up until the year 2000. So that is one of the important aspects as well. And the other thing is educational inequalities across the life course. More or less, most of the low and middle income country data show that majority of women in age 50 or 60 and about do not have education or they haven't attended school. So those kinds of biases play an important role. And as I said at the final point of violence against women as well, again, that's one of the aspects in terms of emerging evidence of, you know, increasing inequalities of interpersonal violence leading to other aspects. Then healthcare inequalities come into issue as well, where we see that uh, um, lack of employment could drive women not using healthcare and also various other aspects with pension. Again, if there is no education, no formal sector, there wouldn't be any pension. So they wouldn't be dependent. In the Nigeria case, there is one more complexity, which, are, which we are very keen to understand further in terms of polygynous households. So we don't understand what happens within those households and the complexity in negotiation between older and younger wives and how um, aging happens in those kinds of households as well. That's something we are currently working on to understand the context further. We've got a lot of other questions. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just put two or three of them together because we're almost yeah. out of time. And then hopefully we'll be able to um, get a list of these questions uh, from the chat at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. um, so one is uh, based on research in India. Sometimes, of course, you find that some people from some socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to self-report disability than others are. And so might that kind of subjective reporting uh, be significant in your study? And then just to um, add a couple of other things, and you may not be able to answer all of these um, very briefly, but um, what, um, what are the lifestyle issues? And I think you've already um, um, referred to some of those that you think are most significant. And linked to that, somebody says, could you say a little bit more about how early fertility can be linked to mobility disability? So here, I guess you're talking about numbers of live births and non-live births and how that reproductive experience through the life course is a very important framer of, 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 of um, people's uh, disability uh, or not in later life. But if you could just briefly reply to those interesting and complex questions in about a minute that would be great i'll try my best so Thank you. we we couldn't get any uh, data on landless laborers so we used the expenditure as one of the proxy measures and as you can see we completely failed in capturing some of those socioeconomic inequalities so this is something we want to understand in terms of socioeconomic differences in self-reporting because we strongly believe given that only 6.5 percent of uh, this uh, um, the mobility disability could be explained using our socio-demographic variables. We strongly believe that there is much more to this, both the measurement and also the missing of socioeconomic variables. And again, coming to the question of early fertility, there are studies that show that uh, early fertility in terms of uh, very early on, 16 years or 17 years with undernutrition could have long-term life consequences and impact also the bone structure, the muscle, and so many other aspects as well. So biologically, 
it, it might not only the biological pathways of impact, it could be also who marries early and what happens to them later in terms of labor market outcomes and other aspects as well. So this longitudinal study of aging found a stronger association between women who had early fertility having some of the more self-reported mobility disability challenges. So, and the, we don't have much of the lifestyle data again. This is again going back to, you know, simplicity. Our study is slightly simple because we don't have some of the data, some of the variables we would like to have, and we don't have that. So that's one of the weak points of the study. Thank you so much, Aravinda. Um, thank you for dealing with a lot of very complicated issues extremely uh, uh, concisely. Um, and now uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Gloria Langert from the University of Southampton, who is going to talk about a very different topic. And I think this is a real strength of our group that we're, we're looking at people using very different kinds of um, methodologies and disciplinary perspectives and looking at a whole range of different issues in different settings. So now we'll be focusing on the issue of social pensions and well-being in sub-Saharan Africa expanding rights to financial protection in old age. So uh, over to you, Gloria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. I'll, I'll hand over to Elizabeth to um, show my slides, please. Yeah, I just wanted you to kind of uh, give you a chance to, to say um, hello. Hello, um, yes, yeah, um, because, <laughs> because, because uh, of background noise in, 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 in my location, I decided to record the, the presentation. So it's spot on 15 minutes, Peter, so you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> OK, let me. And you will as people will have to give me a quick shout out to whether it's working. Come on, slideshow from the beginning. Thank That's you, looking fine. Thank everyone for attending this symposium. As mentioned in the introduction, okay. my talk is on social pensions and well-being in sub-Saharan Africa. And in this talk, I will look at a case study from the project looking at social pensions. Excuse me, but I okay, think the sound quality well. is a bit problematic. Okay, yeah, I think I'll probably just try and, and see a little bit. Sorry. Kenya. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so according to the latest report. Um, so is it not working today? Because we tra we tested it yesterday. Yeah, it's not. So let me just go to my presentation, if that's that's okay. <laughs> I think that's probably a good idea. And we will risk the, um, you know, background noise. I think that would be better. Sorry, I'm... I'm okay, up. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not showing the right slide. Sorry. This is... Just while we're waiting there, please do also put into the chat any suggestions about future meetings for the uh, study group and issues that you might want to raise at the very end of the session when we're going to have a more general discussion. I think we're good to go now, uh, Gloria. So over to you okay. and I'll start the clock from now. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for, for that introduction and sorry for that uh, uh, brief uh, interruption with, with the trying to experiment on technology. <laughs> so I'm hoping everybody can see my slides now. So as mentioned, my talk is on social pensions and well-being in sub-Saharan Africa, expanding rights to financial protection in old age. So um, so there's been, uh, in the over the last 10 years, a number of countries that have introduced social pensions for older people. But first, to put it in context, I provide in this slide statistics showing the most recent information on older people who are in receipt of pension. So this covers both pensions which are contributory and those that are non-contributory. So in terms of the global picture, 68% of older people who are of pensionable age are, are in receipt of a pension, which is either contributory or non-contributory. So when this is broken down by regions, not surprising, Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest coverage at 30%. So this, however, also masks the difference between the regions with Southern African countries having almost 100% coverage, while on the extreme end are countries that have less than 5% of older people 
receiving a pension. So these are countries, for instance, Madagascar, Malawi, Rwanda, Burundi. And then when you have Northern Africa, it, they have, it fares better compared to most of sub Saharan, some parts of sub Saharan Africa, with ranging from 64% in Algeria to 34% in Tunisia. So in East Africa, this ranges from 25% in Kenya and as low as 3% in Tanzania. So the examples I'll draw on in this presentation come from Kenya, which has in the last 10 years been expanding social pensions. And this partly explains this massive difference between Kenya and Tanzania. So according to the latest report from ILO, 14 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have introduced some form of social protection or social pension. So some of these countries like South Africa, Namibia, have been running these social pensions programs for decades. But for most countries, these programs are quite recent, like in the last five years, Nigeria and Uganda have introduced some social pensions. So in these 14 countries, these social pensions are th uh, through a cash transfer. And in this slide, I compare the amount in US dollars that is uh, given to the beneficiaries. So some are quite generous and almost equivalent to an average of an average, the average income in the country. But of course, in some countries, it's, it's, uh, it can sound almost like peanuts, for instance, less than $10 a month. And um, so you might say that this is a very small amount, but I think there's a lot of data that has shown that as little as this cash is, it makes a lot of difference for older people, particularly older people who have not maybe all through their working life been receiving a regular a regular income. So the entitlements vary between countries. In some countries, they have universal, they provide universal coverage, while in others, it's mean tested. Due to the limited resources, most countries have to make decisions on who is most deserving. So, uh, so for the remainder of this presentation, I'll talk about the, old, the Kenya's Older Persons Cash Transfer Program which was implemented from 2006 until 2017 as a means tested program aimed at the most vulnerable and poor older people. So the question we sought to answer, in, one of the questions we sought to answer in a project that has just concluded was how effective was the targeting mechanism in identifying the most in need of the cash transfer and so in, in identifying the most in need of the cash transfer. So the cash transfer program in Kenya used a hybrid method for selection. So in the first stage, it was a community based where a committee was set up in each administrative unit to identify vulnerable people. So after they came up with the list, government officials from the ministry implementing the program would go in, in and verify this list and also conduct a household um, poverty scoring um, a questionnaire. And in this questionnaire now, they created a vulnerability score for each, uh, for each household. And then from this list, they were now able to identify the people who would be selected for, for the, um, to receive the, the cash transfer. So the rationale of this type of selection is that no single selection process is superior. And in settings where there is very little information on people's income, a hybrid method is preferred. Also, almost everyone can be deemed to be poor based on minimum wage or when, when you use monetary measures. So how do you pick out those who are the poorest? So the use of this hybrid type of select targeting process is that the community have additional information or and they have a better understanding on who is vulnerable because they understand their context better. So programs would also want to avoid unfairness or mistargeting as this would negate the aims of, of the program. So, so we conducted a survey in 2016 among older people living in two slum communities in, in Nairobi, where the African Population and Health Research Center conducts a demographic surveillance. So we had a response rate of over 80%, and out of the 601 participants, 36 reported to be enrolled on the program and receiving a pension. So we had to be specific in that someone must already be receiving a pension in order to distinguish between those who just made the list, either from the community selection, 
but we wanted to know the ones who made to the final list of people receiving the income. So that 6% reported that they were in receipt of, of the pension. So we compared the, the beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries in this survey, and we found that the receipt of cash transfer was significantly associated with socioeconomic and monetary indicators. And also older people not working were significantly more likely to be a beneficiary and also being a beneficiary decreased with increased age. So this graph on this slide illustrates this point. It compares beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries by monthly household expenditure in Kenya shillings. So you can see an inverse relationship between household expenditure and being a beneficiary. So what we concluded that this targeting, this targeting method is, um, is good, but it's, of course it's not 100% perfect. There were still low levels of inclusion and exclusion errors. And based on the qualitative evidence that was also collected as part of the project, community mem members did have confidence in the targeting method. But we, however, found that there were, despite the best efforts, there were people, vulnerable people who were missed out. So this included uh, people who with disability, people who are incapacitate, incapacitated, or people who are socially isolated. For instance, those who live alone and maybe with health issues, and they sort of get forgotten in the, they, people tend to forget about them. We also found that quite a lot of people were not able to access their, so, their social pension because they didn't have identification documents. So you can understand in, in the slum setting, there is high risk of issues of fire, mugging, robbery. People, are, people tend to lose their original documents and for older people trying to re, replace these documents can be quite difficult in this type of uh, setting, especially maneuvering the, the um, bureaucracy about replacing documents. So the key messages we really want to, to relay from, from the findings of our project is that a hybrid targeting me method of identifying the most in need works very well because you're able, using different combination of different methods, you're able to identify the most in need. But then the, the, the methods that were used in this particular project did not quite identify what we call the hidden vulnerable older people, and those were the ones with disability or those lacking proof of who cannot identify themselves, so proof of identity or identification documents. So, um, so we were quite pleased with our results, but then at the, at the end of the project, the um, the Kenya government decided to, to shift focus and to move to a universal pension coverage. So they moved from the means tested and targeting only vulnerable people to a universal system, which is which they call Inua Jami, which means uplifting families. And so the eligibility now for this particular program is anybody, so they reduce the criteria quite significantly. You just need to meet three three key uh, criteria. You have to be 70 years and older, not receiving a pension from any other source, and also just prove your, that you're a resident of that community and you prove your age. So three this, more minutes. Yeah, I'm just in the last slide, thank you. <laughs> so this quite uh, eliminated um, the, the long bureaucracy of, of targeting and identifying beneficiaries. So the question really, I just want to pose also uh, maybe a question not, not to the not to the to, to the listeners, but everybody is whether universal or means tested programs are, are ideal depending on on the country country setting. So when when the, when the government of course shifted now to this universal program, it means that they 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 only. So anybody who was 70 and older is was now eligible which leaves out now the people who are in the category of older people, those from 60 to 69, they have to wait until they are 60, uh, 70 rather, in order to, to access their, their pension. So in terms of numbers, when you look at the, 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 the current population census, people who are 70 and older are 12.5% of the total population. And, and the previous project was um, 
the, 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 the means tested was by 2017 had enrolled around 310,000 beneficiaries. The, the, new, the new program, the Inua Jamii 70 plus, has the potential now to cover over a million beneficiaries. And uh, I think by as of end of last year, it had registered almost a million people on the program. Whether these million people who are registered were already receiving the, had started receiving the cash transfer is something that has not really been evaluated. So I, would, uh, I think to conclude, to conclude, I would just say that the jury is still out there in terms of what 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 is ideal for for Kenya whether to 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 go with this universal program where it targets everybody both the rich and the poor or should it just be a means tested which where they only target those vulnerable and poor so i would like to uh, acknowledge the um, ESRC DFID who funded the the project and on the screen there i have references of of publications that have come out of the project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria, and apologies for my, my nagging interruptions. Um, and again, a, a really interesting and clear presentation. I'm waiting for some questions and comments to come through um, in the chat mode. Uh, but um, this is certainly an area that I, I, I'm interested in quite a lot personally in terms of my own research. And I just wondered what the implications of this are in the context of coronavirus and lockdowns in Kenya. My understanding is that as far as we can tell in Kenya to date, <clears throat> the direct effects of coronavirus on older people have not been very significant in terms of infections and mortality. But the, uh, to some degree, uh, the lockdown has had quite a large effect on people's lives. And I wonder whether social pensions have been able to mitigate some of those social and economic effects. It, it actually has. I think um, uh, th this issue of, of uh, so social pensions for older people has been a pet project for the current government. And uh, in the first in the first um, the first time when the, the country went on lockdown, the, during the press conference, the, the, the government or the president was very categorical that they will ensure that the social pensions or the, the social protection programs, particularly the one for older people, keeps running, even though a lot of the government sectors have shut down. So they've, they've put in a lot of measures to make sure that the people who are meant to receive the, any form of social protection but particularly these ones now for older people and orphans and vulnerable children continue to receive. And I think this this is the ministry in charge is one of the few ministries that are still functioning when the government has shut down. So and, and I think there's also been a report that has come out quite recently that showed that they've, it, it has actually been quite beneficial because they are they are they are. Just the very few people who are who have a, a guaranteed regular income in these very uncertain times. So uh, I think we are fortunate enough to have a government that was very keen to ensure that this program continues to run, and they earmarked it that it's something they they'll pay attention to during during the lockdown. Excellent. Um, I've got an, a number of related questions about whether there should be a, a means tested approach with perhaps a lower retirement age or a universal approach with uh, a, a, an older retirement age. And, and one of them is about whether there is an agenda of simply raising the retirement age in general, which is clearly something that we see in other parts of the world. And then another question about the, uh, the costs of either um, implementing and administering a means-tested approach uh, of the kind you've described, as opposed to a universal approach. So uh, a, a question of cost effectiveness. And you might also want to add to that a, a question of equity, that it may be the case that people from uh, who've had more deprived lives are less likely to reach and survive for a period of time beyond the age of 70. I know that's been a criticism of the pension in Lesotho, true, true. that in some ex to some extent it's actually been regressive. Um, so, yeah, if you want to quickly respond to those questions, a couple of other questions have just come in, but I'm afraid we won't have time to take them. Yeah, I'll, I'll catch them up in the, in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think that according to, in, in my opinion, the, the equities is actually quite 
important by by having universal by moving to the universal scheme at 70 plus you you, you don't really address e equitable you don't really address equity because now you, you don't discriminate in terms of who gets it so so i would i would i would I would advocate for for a means tested uh, means tested program as opposed to a universal. And in terms of the running costs, I think both both at least from the experience of Kenya, both require more or less the same um, administrative costs because they still have to go to the communities to verify the sensitization. So there's a lot of the similar I would say similar type of uh, administrative costs that goes in running both. So uh, I wouldn't see the 70 plus as having less administrative cost compared to the means tested. And, and, and yeah, I think based, based on, on even the, the, the level of government involvement for both has, has been quite intense. So that's it. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm afraid, again, we're going to have to move on quite swiftly because we, we've got another very good presentation to squeeze in as well as hopefully some more general discussion. So thank you, Gloria. I'm now going to hand over to Ken Bluestone from Age International. And I think it's really good that we don't just include you know, card carrying academics, but also people who are working in stakeholder organisations in, in, in these meetings. Um, and Ken is going to um, ask the question, do international policy agreements and frameworks help create sustainable responses to the rights and needs of older people? So over to you, Ken. The floor is now yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And it's a real pleasure to be with everyone. Um, so look, I'm going to begin my presentation with a disclaimer. Um, I'm not an academic um, and this is going to become abundantly clear as I proceed with my presentation. I'm, I'm an activist, I'm a policy analyst, I'm a lobbyist and occasionally a campaigner. Um, so what I cannot promise is academic rigor with my comments, but I'll do my best to illuminate the subject from my own perspective and experience. So as you can see from the first slide that uh, my main affiliation is with Age International, which is a UK member of the Global Help Age Network. But I'm also chair of something called the Global Alliance for the Rights of Older People. And I'm a director of Common Age, a Commonwealth accredited association. And I mention these affiliations only so I can say that I'm not speaking on behalf of any of these organizations today, but that I'm expressing my own views. Um, broadly speaking, my comments are embedded in a political economy analysis and approach. It's to say, trying to understand better the underlying mechanisms, the pushes and pulls that result in better policy. Um, and I think in a way that what I'm going to be presenting on picks up on something, uh, a key issue that was raised by Penny at the very beginning of uh, this, this session, which is that how we frame our understanding and, of, and the analytical categories that we use can both hinder or help um, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so, on to the question at hand, do international policy agreements and frameworks help create sustainable responses to the rights and needs of older people? Well, the answer is yes and no. That's to say, we need to do more and we need to do better. So I'm going to jump ahead now to the end of my presentation and the conclusions, and I'm basically going to be arguing that a legally binding international convention on the rights of older persons is necessary for achieving a systematic and sustainable response within the UN system. Along the way, I'm going to outline some of the key elements of what international agreements and frameworks should provide and use these to assess the impact of some existing international agreements. And I'm also going to look ahead to um, what's next on the agenda, the decade of healthy aging. Um, and finally, I will reflect very briefly on the what this is a, the, the current context of COVID-19. So um, to begin, um, why are international agreements necessary? What do inter good international agreements provide us? Um, they give us um, a set of the normative standards. They tell us, they help guide us in terms of um, what we um, should be doing by the us, I mean governments, but also um, those uh, the, the wider stakeholders uh, that both work alongside, but also influence governments and influence 
things. Um, so a good international agreements should provide that clarity, should articulate very clearly what it is we should be doing. Um, good agreements strengthen accountability. Um, they do this in a number of ways. They do this by either having um, a being uh, legally binding, having very clear um, obligations that states um, must fulfill. Um, but they also strengthen accountability by having um, clear reporting mechanisms, things that allow there to be um, scrutiny of what governments do. Um, it's also about, and we'll come to this point in a moment, about um, strengthening the accountability by improving um, the dialogue and the space for interaction between civil society and governments. Um, good agreements frame aspirations. So I mean this in two ways. Um, first, that um, any international agreement is aspirational. It is there because it is trying, it's seeking to do better. It's presenting a vision, a, a, a proposition that um, the world can be a better place. Otherwise, we, why should we have it? Um, but framing also in terms of changing, shifting, shaping um, the narrative around um, the, the, the topic at hand so that we think of um, what we're trying to do in a way which is more helpful, which is more um, equality based. And this is particularly the case for international agreements which are human rights focused. And but but not only. And then finally, um, as I mentioned already, um, good international agreements can, should, do encourage participation and dialogue between civil society and government. Um, there is an even even a legally binding a, um, a human rights convention only really has meaning in the ability of um, civil society to um, hold government to account, to, to create a platform for interaction between civil society and government to achieve and arrive at not only better um, a policy in terms of um, the, the, the content that's in it, but also critically, and the whole point of it, is better implementation. So I'm going to use these criteria to just go through a little bit of a historical overview of some of the current and past international agreements that are um, relevant um, for older people. These are by far not the only ones, um, but they just give us a kind of a, a quick historical overview. So going way back to 1948, um, the, 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 um, the, the origins of the human rights um, framework, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says categorically that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Um, and you see that I put yes, but. And the yes, but is that in, in its framing, even though it was categorical involving everyone, it, it was very specific about um, the, the, the need for addressing discrimination on a number of grounds. But the one thing it left out was age. Um, so in, in actual fact, it, it was very non-specific that these rights referred to the experience that a person has in later life. And that has hugely influenced, I would argue, how um, a whole range of different international agreements have um, been developed um, over time and has directly influenced the, um, the, the invisibility and the point that I'll come back to of, of older people within these agreements. Um, jumping ahead to 1991, um, the, the UN agreed and something called the UN principles. Um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm just going to come back to all of these things quickly with a matrix um, in my next slide. Um, the UN principles for older period persons, um, this this is a great document. I, I, people should read this. Um, the principles, many, not all, but many um, still stand today. It is a, really the bedrock of a lot of thinking that should we should be taking forward. It isn't perfect, um, but crucially, uh, the thing that's missing from it is that sense of obligation. So within the, the, the principles, it says that member states should do this whenever possible. And that basically means, um, first of all, you know, who amongst us, and it's a great crowd that we have, have read the UN principles. I doubt that there's any official in government unless they are particularly studious or totally immersed in aging issues that is is aware of them or has read them so they don't influence policy now they were very impactful for the period of time which they were created but they no longer 
fulfill that function. Um, similarly, for the Madrid International Plan of Action and Aging, which goes a step further um, uh, to the principles, um, hugely influential, hugely impactful. It goes a step further because it, it creates an, a, a, a much more detailed articulation of both what the rights and needs of older people are, critically what governments should do about it, and rather innovative from, from where we were before, it puts in place a framework a mechanism for um, a monitoring this. Um, so the review mechanism, but still it is non-binding. Um, and it, it, it's not just that it's non-binding, and it, it is a, um, so non-binding meaning it's voluntary. I just want to share a very quick anecdote. Um, I, I was in a meeting of um, uh, directors of um, high level civil servants across UK government um, talking about human rights of older persons. Um, and these are the people that were responsible for coordinating how aging issues is done in, in across the different government departments. And when I mentioned MIPA, Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, um, not a single one of them had acknowledged, recognized what this is. So this is no longer um, sufficient as a, a framework which is informing policy. Yet, cynically, um, we continue to review it. So what that means is we take it out of a drawer every five years and say, oh, what have we done these five years? And can we account, can we report against the categories? So it doesn't really function anymore as a, articulating, as clarifying, as in for informing policy. Um, moving to the current context, Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this was um, a sea change um, on, on a number of levels. First of all, this was no, this was taking older people out of the cab, the box of um, the, the aging community. This is universal. This is all countries. Critically, this is about stakeholders cutting across every possible imaginable aspect of the human experience that focused on making this come into being. And, and that has taken the, the agendas around older people's issues out of the shadows um, and into this 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 the the main onto the main stage if you will um, it recognizes older people within it it recognizes crucially that data is that is necessary it is important evidence that there should be better data disaggregation it has introduced this concept this uh, this commitment pledge to leave no one behind which includes a recognition that Age discrimination is one aspect of what um, uh, influences, what, 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 what affects people's ability to en engage in society, to, 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 to receive the rights they need. But the, the, the biggest problem that we have at the moment is that there's a lag. So there are some very good words and very good aspirations embedded within the sustainable development goals, but the overarching architecture, uh, the systems that are in place aren't fit for purpose. So you can remove the upper age cap on capturing data on um, measuring um, violence against women. So before it was capped at the age of 49, you would only measure and only uh, up until that age. Now there is no upper age limit, but actually, but there's no mechanisms in place for capturing that data. So we still have a way to go. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the convention here on the rights of people with disabilities, and I mentioned it for two reasons. Um, I mentioned it because there is a huge crossover, huge overlap in the experience that um, a older pe many people who are older have with disabilities. So in that sense, the rights that are captured within the convention um, they are there also to support and to help people who are older, who are living with disabilities. But it's not for all older people, of course. And that's one of the big gaps. Um, three minutes. I three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> The big, the big, the big problem um, with the convention is so the, the the other reason for mentioning it is the fact that it is the illustration, the demonstration currently of that international agreements have an impact. And if you have any doubt in your mind, go into a public place when we are allowed to go into public places and disability accessible toilets, ramps, everything that has been influenced the way we 
think about people with disabilities has also all been directly influenced by the framing that's come out of this convention. Um, and uh, the decade of healthy aging, um, I'll come on to that in just a moment. So look, these slides will be shared with you. And um, what's important by looking at all of this is to say that all of these different categories and all of these different col um, uh, columns um, uh, for all these different agreements, none of them does the trick. None of them fully addresses what a good international agreement should be for older people. Um, looking ahead to um, the decade, so, and, and the impact of those agreements is linked to um, their universality. It's linked, as well as I mentioned, the extent. It, so it, an agreement has, has, has impact if they are known, if they have resonance, um, and they're being perceived as relevant by policymakers. Um, they need to provide the guidance and clarity to not only governments, but other stakeholders. Um, you know, and they have to create this space for civil society. Um, so the decade looking ahead is going to have um, uh, 10 priorities in it that have been identified by the World Health Organization. Um, it, it, it is not an international agreement in the same sense that the other things are, but it is based in an international agreement, the global strategy. And, and this is a particularly interesting thing because it, it is root, grounded, rooted in both um, a technical expertise around health and as well as being a political agreement. Um, the decade is an action agenda, so it's less about a normative framing, but there is one exception within it, which is that there is within one of the 10 priorities, a campaign against ageism. And this has the potential for um, contributing to how we frame things. So last minute, the, I'm afraid. All right, um, which is a shame because I'm getting to the interesting bit, Peter. Sure, I couldn't have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I guess I think um, some people will need to leave the meeting in eight all right. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the 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 one thing we know about um, international uh, agreements is that they're not sufficient for for. For, for tackling societal norms. We know this because we still have racism, we still have gender equality, even though we have international agreements around that. Um, what we do know, however, is that the history of the UN system teaches us that it is the, the articulation, the further clarification of human rights through successive treaties that makes and these things work better. So this is a quote from the High Commissioner of Human Rights, who shows that it's not just about a legal basis, but it's also about how the whole UN system works. And the history of the narrative of older people within this framework, within this overarching UN system, has been one of systemic invisibility, one of marginalization and deprioritization. It's been a history of not recognizing the specific experience that older women and men have when they get older, not capturing the data and evidence, and not identifying um, the reporting and acting on the repeated human rights abuses. Um, bringing this into the context of the current day, this invisibility, this marginalization, this deprioritization goes right to the root of create what has created the conditions in the responses to COVID-19 that have explicitly valued older people's lives less, that have created the opportunity for blatant age discrimination to be visible, and especially that the deaths that have taken place in care homes and the rhetoric that, I, you know, the, that, that, that the, this COVID-19 in somehow could be helpful by culling older people, this is testament to the truly horrific challenges that we still have to overcome. Um, look, we are seeing signs of change. Thank you, Ken. Can, can you um, wrap up now, please? Yep. Yeah. Just wrapping it up now. So we we have seen signs change. This SDGs are proof of that. The recent policy paper of the um, UN Secretary General on COVID-19 and older persons is proof of that. Um, but it's still one step forward, two steps back. So what we're lacking are the tools that can create the basis for systemic change. And that is a legally binding human rights convention. Um, so it's not just about the rights uh, words on a page, but it's about the process and it's about involving older people in that process. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for my brutal chairing. This is what happens when you have five speakers in a single session. <laughs> but we have already got one question from 
Penny, in fact, we've got another one now as well, which is, could you say something very briefly about uh, how ageism fits within all of that? And then I'll take the other question as well that's just come in from Maria Valenzuela, which is about uh, regional agreements uh, may also be relevant, such as the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights and Older People. Um, and some other people refer to um, updates to NIPA and to WHO, but I think you covered those in later parts of your presentation already. So if you could take a couple of minutes, I think particularly perhaps to engage with this issue of ageism and how that yeah. fits within the decade of healthy ageing, I think. Uh, well, well, look, it, 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 the, the WHO and its member states agreed to this, identified that one of the major obstacles that is interfering with the ability for older people to achieve better health are the embedded assumptions, attitudes, discrimination added, that we have in society, ageism, and that better health means tackling these attitudes and, and, and changing that. And the interaction between understanding that where ageism is concerned and a convention is that where a convention, when it when it works well and the process works right, and as we've seen with, with, the, with the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities, it reframes people's attitudes. It changes people's perceptions away from this is a person that we do things to, to a person who has rights, a person who has agency, even a person that is living with multiple um, uh, health conditions, even a person that has multiple disabilities is still a person that has voice and has rights and has agency and needs to be respected equally to other people in society. And that's what we can do. We can achieve, we can tackle ageism. We need both. We need a campaign to tackle ageism, society and culture, but we also need that overarching um, legal standard and we need to mobilize um, uh, civil society to push governments to do more around this. Thank you, Ken, and thanks for uh, keeping it as brief as you possibly could, because there's a lot to say there. I would like now to basically hand over the reins of the session back to um, either Elizabeth or Penny, because this is the inaugural um, uh, study group meeting, and I think they just um, want to invite perhaps some wider discussion, although I'm mindful that we only have about two or three minutes before at least we officially end, uh, and also just make some uh, more general comments about next steps for the study group. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute privilege to chair this session. Uh, I will now um, mute and pass over to Elizabeth. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, or Penny, do you want to come in uh, first? Um, I just think that this has been really, really interesting. We've had uh, a very large number of people involved um, and uh, and there's some very interesting comments that I'd like to sort of follow up with in terms of suggesting a panel. And maybe uh, we would actually come back to people who've made comments to see if they'd like to participate pulling together a panel or just speaking on a panel. Um, I'm actually not, I, I haven't got any sort of ideas specifically for uh, drawing this together in a discussion. I don't know if you do, uh, Lizzie. No, I mean, I just, um, I thought the papers kind of, although they really dis, um, sort of illuminated very different aspects, they, they they came together really, really nicely by kind of addressing issues around uh, rights, around discrimination, around kind of how we get the sort of perspective right of kind of seeing the individuals and giving them agency and the voice and, um, and individuality, but then at the same time somehow um, using that in order to, uh, to influence uh, policy and policymakers do often kind of respond to to the numbers. Um, so I think um, uh, there the, the were some really good reminders to to ourselves, to certainly to myself, um, of kind of how to take some of these criticisms and these pitfalls um, on uh, on board. Uh, and I suppose the, the the way to really kind of build on this work is to kind of have more case studies, have more kind of examples of um, of research um, to sort of see how uh, what what works and 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 how we can learn from each other. So I think that's very much what I would like from this uh, this um, special interest group. If if we could have meetings every two or three months where where people just kind of talk talk about their research or their policy work or their activism work uh, and uh, and kind of report on 
on um, on on how that goes and what works and what doesn't work. Yes, that's great. So we're getting more more suggestions now coming in. Uh, so we'll look at all those. Um, you also have the um, the email address to to contact us as well. So I think we've sort of we've hit our deadline. I want to thank everybody for for participating, for the people who came, to Peter, to the speakers. And I have to say that we didn't plan it, but I did. I do think that the the, the different papers did speak to each other quite well. So that was kind of a nice thing uh, to come out, out of that. I mean, if people if people want to kind of um, stick around for a few more minutes and just kind of unmute themselves and introduce themselves, I, I'd be very uh, happy for that. I mean, if we were in a genuine conference now, that that is naturally what would uh, what would happen is that people would kind of mingle and, and, and say, oh, I'm so and so I work on this. So so I think um, I'm very happy to, to stick around for a bit longer if people just want to say hello and who they are and what they work on and why they're interested uh, in, in this group. So, um, yeah. yeah speak up well yeah well i'm very happy to do that for a little bit as well um and i'd also like to do a plug for the uh the global platform on older people and coronavirus in low and middle income countries i just did send a web link around through chat um slightly earlier and um, we do run a, a couple of um webinars every month um, on, on issues that I think will be of interest to this group. And one of the things we may want to explore, um, uh, Lizzie and, and Penny, is maybe having a joint um, meeting of the special interest group and obviously the global platform, which specifically looks at coronavirus. Because I guess that to some degree is these days the elephant in the room when we're having these discussions. Of course, we're not just interested in coronavirus and it's very important that we don't neglect other issues. Although sometimes people say, oh, well, that neglect in itself is a consequence of coronavirus. So it gets somewhat circular. But nonetheless, I would be very happy to see if there's some kind of joint um, event that we might want to do, um, you know, in, in, in a month or so. Um, so that's just to throw that out there. Anyone want to come in at this stage? Be bold. I would just like to introduce myself, sorry. Yeah. I'm Adele. I'm a PhD student with the University of Edinburgh. Um, and my special interest is regarding dementia and memory difficulty um, across cultures. Um, and also just recently just thinking about the ethical uh, differences again in, in how how some of the, uh, the dilemmas that we encounter when we have to apply for ethical approval with vulnerable groups um, and people that might have cognitive impairment and overloading them with a lot of, of information. So, but yeah, that's me. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome Adele. Thank you. Jane, did you want to say something? Yes, Elizabeth. How are you, all of you? We're fine, thank you. I'm very, a very grateful uh, forum. I, I think uh, I'm very happy to meet Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, Gloria, and I think Rose was also somewhere. Those are my my tutors. I am um, just finishing my master's in uh, global aging and policy. And I can say that uh, it is quite uh, an enlightening uh, forum, which we wish to continue with and uh, continue following. In terms of work on the ground, there's a lot of work to do. We, even within my country, a lot of initiatives have started. And I think as we progress with the group, uh, we'll get to a point where we'll also be sharing the activities that are taking place. Thank you very much, Penny. I, I, I am grateful you are the new a friend in the group, <laughs> and I like your context. Please make sure you share that, and if we get time, we talk more about it. I like the issue of ageism and the way maybe we are looking at it, so that we try to make sure that it doesn't become a negative connotation. But we... thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, Rose, you had your hand up. Hello, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rose Muhudu uh, from Kenya. I was a student at uh, University of Southampton. I just finished my master's in global aging and policies. 
I work under the Kenyan government in the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection under the cash transfer program. And I'm happy to have joined the symposium and uh, we hope to continue with the same. Thank you so much. Great. And then T Tandik, I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. No, my, my name is Tandi Sabana, yes. And I am from the National University of Lesotho. Um, I'm glad that I've been able to partake in this discussion, really. And uh, I, I just liked how we looked at aging issues, but in particular, my main interest is looking at men at older age, because often we talk of women vulnerability. And I think with in patriarchal societies where the expectations are that the men are strong and still should be providing, I think sometimes we overlook them and they may even that may exacerbate their vulnerability. So I, I'm very grateful that I was able to partake here and I hope to take part in more discussions. Great, thank you very much. Um, I can I can maybe use this kind of uh, opportunity to make a very um, unashamed uh, plug for our uh, master's programs. Um, we have two master's distance learning master's programs in gerontology and in global aging and policy. And it's really lovely to see uh, several of our uh, students or former students here uh, today. So uh, do have a look on our website if you're interested. Uh, I saw that Prince, you had your um, hand up. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to say a very big thanks to Dr. Elizabeth for inviting me to this symposium. I really, really enjoyed myself and I learned so much uh, from Dr. Penny and from all the speakers. So, and I would look forward to more discussions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Prince. Uh, then we've got uh, Tulika. Are you there? You need to un unmute yourself. Hello, I am from India. It was, uh, I joined this to learn many more things and it was very informative. Thank you very much. I am also a former MSc gerontology student. Uh, at present, I am I work with palliative care organizations in India, and sometimes I also work as research assistant on ICMR funded projects. So all the information and knowing things what all are going on around the world was very useful. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Tulika. Lovely to see you. And Nidhi, Nidesh, are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah. Good morning, all. I'm Nidesh. Uh, I completed my MPhil program from uh, uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences in India, and I was a former student at Southampton University. And I work on aging and informal labor participation. And um, yeah, I'm planning to do my PhD in coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you very much uh, for introducing yourself. Is, is anyone else um, um, would like to briefly speak or just say hello? No, I'm yeah. yeah. Please. Did, did anyone want to say anything? OK, maybe um, <clears throat> maybe I misunderstood that. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so what I, I will sort of do from a sort of administrative point of view is is sort of anybody who's who's left their email addresses. Um, I'm, I'll, I'm going to email you just to get explicit uh, consent whether you would like to join uh, the team site. We've sort of set up a, 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 a team's um, platform for, for this group. And that's where we were planning on putting the uh, the slides, uh, for example, from from today's uh, talks. Uh, so I'll ask your permission uh, whether you want to join that. And in that case, 
um, you'll get uh, access to the slides and then uh, we would also then use this uh, Teams platform in order to inform people of um, of um, new new events coming up and uh, I think the beauty of, of using such a platform is that people can then also kind of post on there themselves so it's not something that just kind of <clears throat> radiates out from 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 myself and penny and, and the organizers of the group but you can stick things on there you can say oh there's this event coming up or oh there's um uh, this new publication of mine or i'm just starting on this research so so kind of i think it would be a really uh, good opportunity to use uh, the, the the site uh, to, to share resources share ideas plan future meetings uh, so um yeah hopefully most of you will agree to, to, to join that Yes, and, and if people could send links to um, preprints, so so that we can, so that everybody that we're, we're that can have access to this will have access to those things, because not everybody is has got a link to a university library and so on. So that would be really nice. Yeah. And then, and then I should say also that as a member of the SIG is free, but you can become a member of the BSG as well. That's not free. Um, uh, but it does give you access to um, uh, conferences, which, you know, in-person conferences. So we're bridging two things here um, and you can have access to both. But certainly part, being part of the SIG is, is for free. And we, we are trying to get, we have ambitions to be a global network. Break through those barriers on on the libraries and so on that people can't access information, and to make sure that we're getting information that maybe, uh, for instance, in Britain we're not accessing, so that people can uh, spread what they have to say. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the benefits of um, the unintended consequences of, of coronavirus is that these kinds of meetings have moved kind of online much more, and 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 therefore have become. Um, much more kind of accessible. So I think uh, we have a more global audience than we would have done if we were stuck in in, in Bristol today. Um, uh, so yeah, it's uh, that's that's really good. Yeah, people could use um, the, the the team site to to request access to to publications and resources that they can't uh, get hold of. So so do uh, do put on requests there. We we have the benefit of, of really excellent libraries um, here. Um, Aravinda, do you want to say anything last? Yeah, I just want to say that in addition to sharing resources or ideas, this could be a platform as well. If somebody feels there is a need to have a particular topic to discuss, which we started to mention early on, but also a methodological discussion or a kind of, you know, critical perspective or or even kind of online activism. If we feel like somebody somewhere is having certain type of struggle and they need online support as well as issues related to, you know, supporting each other in multiple ways. Uh, if uh, some early career researchers feel like they would like to work, but they particularly miss certain methods or understanding of existing data or aspects related to that as well, we can support. We can think of, you know, the needs available from the other side and take it from there. That's what I was thinking. Great. Very good. Okay. I think I think it might be time to draw it to a close yeah. as we're now 15 minutes over. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for joining in and thank you for your participation in advance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Take care. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.